So the the first question that was sort of, sort of I was thinking about as those presentations were coming uh, through, and also the the that we've had through the chat room, is about um, a lot of this discussion is focused on online platforms, um, on Twitter, um, and on uh, what we can do uh, to kind of take advantage of, of different uh, resources out there. But nothing really has been talked about so far in terms of emails and email marketing. Um, and obviously, we all do quite a lot of email marketing ourselves. Um, and I was just wondering what the panel thought uh, would be, you know, wh what they think about email communications. Is it still as important as it always has been? <laughs> just to say, this question has also been posed by Solomon Schoenfield um, and Nadine Smith via Twitter. So, Nick, do you want to start? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it's incredibly important. I think until until it stops being important, it's incredibly important until people stop checking their emails every day. I think there's a danger that people don't look at emails a lot. I think there's qu it's quite likely that people don't look at emails a lot, but it's still the biggest draw of traffic to the ODI site when we send a newsletter. Um, I My interest in emails is both ensuring that we have good email products so that our newsletters highlight the best of what ODI does, but also more... Um, more specifically, l ensuring that the researchers are using the, the kinds of day-to-day -day interactions they have, both online and offline, um, to collect peer the email addresses of peers and people that they can then send their papers to. So every time a paper is released by ODI, and ODI, you know, we have some big reports we do, and we have some top, top things, but we actually produce a huge amount. We produce something like 700 or 800 things a year. So we're, we're, we're actually, a lot of our work is contractual in that way. Um, every time they re release a report, they get an email from us saying, have you thought about the 20 people that you're going to send this to in their email? And we push a lot um, that the, the emails should come from, from people, from actual people. In the same way as we want them to develop their Twitter lists, we want them to develop a profile amongst their peers so that when that email arrives in someone's inbox and it has their name, they're known about. So. Uh, again, the, the heads of programs are very important for us, our sort of subject area specialists in terms of we pushing their profiles so that when they send out an email, those emails are read, because I think that's the biggest challenge of email. Okay, do either of you want to come in on that before I open it up to everyone? Yeah, well, we do something similar. Um, so we, we've, we try and get, again, our researchers, when they publish their reports, take some pride in it and to put together a list of sort of key stakeholders. And we aim for about 100. Um, but we only do about 60 reports uh, a year. But I totally agree, got to come from the individual. I'd just say something about the press office, though, because we use email in the press office quite a lot. Um, but when I first started working in the press office, we used to send our press releases out by fax. Uh, oh, and cool. I just put my pager number at the bottom. <laughs> uh, and I, when I first joined IPPI, I sort of had this principle that you'd never put a press release out without doing a ring round. So I would, you know, sort of jot down all the major outlets and think, well, I want to get this story in the Daily Mirror. Who is the most likely person that I know on the Daily Mirror to write that kind of story? And so I would write down a list of names. And I would always make 10 phone calls after I put out every single press release. I don't do that anymore because these people are so time poor. And one of the things that's happened with newspapers is they have fewer journalists producing more content, which means the more ring round calls they get, the more, frankly, pissed off they are during the day. So now I sort of do email, text, tweet, and only call right at the end. Uh, and so my text usually says, uh, um, you know, I've sent you a story about blah, and it's, you know, a single line. Uh, gives a shout if you want to talk, talk more about it. And that, that is my sort of mechanism now to replace uh, the ring round. Uh, and so, so the, I the email is not the primary uh, contact. It's the where to find out more. Just quickly, as a consumer of this stuff, that sounds like a very appealing strategy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can we have a show of hands then? Who wants to... Got one there, one there, and one there. So if you want to go first, and then we'll we'll take them in threes, and then into the panel. Hi, um, fascinating stuff. Thank you very much. My name is John Coventry. I'm from the campaign platform Change.org, which is an almost entirely email-based, email and news media-based platform. So I'm not from the think tank at all. So sorry, I'm having the first question. Um, the first one was uh, the first question was about how do you think the changing news cycle? I'm interested to know Richard's views, particularly, and yourselves from the Economist, about there being no more real kind of embar zero zero one embargoes are kind of a thing of the past, and how that works in terms of interventions in the news cycle using data. I think that would be quite interesting. Um, I'm also fascinated by email, but I think we've had a question on that, so I'll just leave it on the news cycle question. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so there was one over there. 
Yep, lady in the front here. Yep. Katie Schmucker from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Um, I was interested in Richard's pyramid of engagement and the missing middle and the idea that you can sort of a lot a lot more sort of video and animation might be a way of filling that missing middle. But I was just wondering in the ones that you have done, have you done any analysis of who's consuming them in terms of, you know, is it actually reaching the audiences that you really want to reach? Yeah, and at the back there, please. Thank you. I am Enrique Mendizabal. I, I edit a blog called On Think Tanks, and I collaborate with Michael Quabbit. Um, I'm, I'm convinced by this. I think this is fascinating. I'm really excited about this. Um, but uh, as Nick, as Nick, you you would know, and um, it'd be interesting to discuss is if this audience was uh, uh, researchers and think tankers and uh, and communicators in a developing country, which is where we do a lot of the work. Um, people would struggle to think about how they get not even half the way you've got in your organisations and. And what will be very interesting um, is to, for you to reflect on the kind of resistance uh, that you might still get, the kind of uh, politics inside the organization that you've experienced, and the way in which you get some of those um, sort of enemies of change, uh, let's put another right word, but the skeptics of change, I mean, rightly so, uh, uh, on your side, or at least to give it a go. That would be very useful, I think. Brilliant. Okay, so just to recap, we've got a question from John on the news agenda and is it changing from Kate on the pyramid of engagement and from Enrique on uh, if it's appropriate or possible for people in developing countries to adapt some of these things. So um, I'll go with you. For, uh, in fact, I'll go with you first, Richard. Richard, sorry. go for yeah. it. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, Johnny C. His name's Coventry, but he supports Tottenham. I know all this from Twitter. Um, you are right that the minute past midnight embargo is long past its sell-by date. But the industry, by which I mean um, sort of PRs and journalists, have not really worked out uh, what we're going to do about this. Um, I mean, I have noticed that, uh, and, and know from in government, that um, m major announcements are given via briefing note, which you'll never see, but they do exist, um, with uh, 10 o'clock embargoes. And you can tell that, again, by Twitter, because, for example, I think it was yesterday or the day before, Joe Johnson was appointed as the, the head of the policy unit at number 10, and I found that out uh, at you know exactly 10 o'clock on Twitter from three political correspondents all at the same time. Uh, why? Because they've been given that story with an embargo. And um, so 10 o'clock is the new uh, uh, minute past midnight. But I... From a, because we're not number 10, I'm sort of reluctant at a press, uh, 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 in my press office to put out press releases with a, with a 10 o'clock embargo because they'll have a different date. And I just think my main... Uh, I just think journalists will get confused. Is this a Monday for Tuesday or a yeah. Tuesday for Wednesday? And I sort of feel we need, a new, we need a new thing to put at the top of our press release because the minute past midnight embargo is obviously, is you saying, I want to get this in the daily papers in that day and I would like primarily breakfast broadcast coverage. Uh, but there's a new thing now, which is that actually it's the evening news on the day before that tends to cover what's going to be in the papers the next day. And it is a shift, and I don't think we've worked it out. Um, Katie, on video analysis, have we done any analysis of who watches the videos? No. Uh, do we know how many people have watched the videos? No. Do we know how many times the videos have been watched? Yes. Uh, do we know when, I mean, for example, that one I showed you about housing benefit. Do we know that um, Liam Byrne has watched that video? No. Do we know that he's uh, understood the idea and has talked in an interview to the Evening Standard about it? Yes. Uh, and that is as sophisticated as my uh, evaluation and analysis gets at the moment. Um, I think, that, you know, the more evaluation you can do, the better. Uh, if you spend your life doing evaluation, though, you won't do the, do the doing bit, and that's the trade-off. Um, uh, just on developing countries and things like that, um, I'm really interested in this, partly because I uh, used to work at the Department for International Development. I'm interested in international development, interested in developing countries and work at a think tank. So tonight, actually, I'm flying to South Africa um, to volunteer for a week with an organisation called Civicus, who are a sort of federation of civil society organisations, who I think in some senses work at the toughest end of this uh, international development area because they're you know they're interested in civil society transparency you know there's a clear tension between
corrupt, repressive regimes and their work. Uh, and so I f find it really interesting. And so a part of me um, uh, going down to Johannesburg is to take some skills from the developing world. But to be honest, I want to learn how, uh, what the challenges are and think creatively about how, how they overcome. So I don't have an answer, but um, maybe at the end of next week I might have a better answer. Okay, thanks Richard. Um, John? I guess I can answer the news cycle mm -hmm. thing. Well, I can't really because I work at The Economist and we've tended, sorry, I'll speak into this thing. We've tended to try and ignore the news cycle a bit um, uh, to try and not get too caught up in, okay, this is a big thing in British politics and particularly in kind of Westminster politics. It's like, okay, this week it's benefits reform week. And I don't know who decides this. I guess the government does with its grid. But it's often not a very good reason for writing about benefits reform. So we tend to be read by, rather led by our kind of own reporting rather than what's going on in the news cycle. Um, though, you know, clearly there are exceptions to that. On embargoes, I think you're right. Um, they're sort of, they've gone, haven't they? Except in the field of science reporting. We do quite a lot of reporting at The Economist on scientific papers. And there, if you break the embargo, you will no longer be given the paper in advance. And so science journalists really, really care about embargoes and stick to them. Um, so I don't know what the answer for, for you guys is for that. But I suspect Richard's right. And it's, you know, maybe you want to do away with them altogether and just think about, well, who is a good outlet for this particular story? On, on the analysis point, I can answer that, you know, analysis of videos. We have so much data about who's watching what, who's reading what, where, at what time of the day, what they're having for breakfast while they're doing for it. Um, it's kind of interesting. I have a dashboard at work that tells me, you know, in real time exactly what's going on at The Economist website, you know, how many people are reading which story, where they are. But you can sort of look at it for a bit and then go a bit mad. I mean, ultimately, if the stuff that you produce is good enough, uh, then people will um, seek it out, retweet it, get excited about it. Um, we've got a story on our website at the moment. It's, I say it's on our website. It's not really on our website. It's, it's living somewhere on kind of Reddit and Facebook. But um, one of our journalists wrote a 3,000-word essay in 2010 about how useless it is to have a PhD. Um, and she has a PhD herself. This has been the most popular story uh, on economist.com for the last kind of two weeks, I think. It goes sort of against everything that you would expect to be true of uh, digital media. You know, it's long form. Uh, it's about something kind of quite uh, wonky, of a fairly narrow interest. And yet it's hugely, hugely popular, way more popular than our, you know, recent coverage of the Arab Spring or, or, or whatever. So which just goes to show nobody really knows anything. Um, you can monitor, monitor it all. Try and run your website like you know, the, the Daily Mail does, where you go into their newsroom and they have, uh, a, you know, a big screen that tells them, their journalists, exactly how many hits each story is getting. And if the, you know, kind of Jennifer Lopez bikini disaster story on the uh, <laughs> left or right rail, I can't remember, whichever side it is, you know, isn't doing as well as the other story, then it gets canned and moved up. But I think ultimately doing that, you kind of lose sight of what your, you know, what your kind of values are as an organization, and it's a strategy of sort of diminishing returns. But obviously knowing something is helpful. There's a medium, isn't there, between um, knowing, uh, you know, acting entirely according to what your users are telling you and um, not knowing anything about who they are or what they're up to. Okay, great, thanks. And uh, Nick, on those three questions. Um, okay, I'll take, uh, I think I'll leave the question on news cycle because I think it's been answered by others and uh, ODI sometimes in a, is in a slightly different position being a bit niche, a niche politics kind of player to, um, to uh, sort of IPPRs of this world. Um, and also my colleague Jonathan would be the one to answer the question rather than, my, rather than me. Um, but uh, on Enrique's question about enemies of change in developing countries and so on, I mean, I think, I think I've worked with Enrique quite a lot and um, I've published uh, blogs on his platform. Um, I think my talk is about that. Um, I think it, how do you get the enemies of change on your side? I think you have to convince them, you have to have the arguments, you have to understand the context, and the context is very different in lots of developing countries to the context we have here. Um, so there may be different answers, but having, a, having someone thinking about what the, what the context is and what the answer is, is very important. And think tanks shouldn't just be pe full of thinkers on the research side, they need to be thinkers on the communications side, I think, too, sometimes. So I think it's quite important to have access to those people and not just get in people that are low-level, um, practical people that can pu put a report online and write a summary for it. They need to actually think, what, what are we doing and how are we going to better reach them? Um, analysis of videos. Uh, 
I won't talk about analysis of videos, and but I'll talk about the kinds of information we get off our monitoring and evaluation dashboard. Um, we get uh, confirmation that the things that we thought were true are true as communicators. So it helps us to tell the story of the fact that if something is blogged about, if a report is blogged about and tweeted a bit and we send an email about it and we do various things, more people will read it. Um, if we manage to produce, uh, our tr the trick for us is trying to find a way to do all of those things with minimal effort because we have a lot of things being produced at any one particular time and it's a lot of effort if you if every single thing has to be go out in all of those different formats so i've spent a lot of time in how you what you can automate versus what you can't what you can do quickly we don't do very little in video we do a lot more in audio because it's so much easier to do things in audio um and the dashboards help to tell that story and then hopefully they also help to give you the um they've helped to increase my budget um, because I've, I've been able to tell a story of positive change through them. So I think ha it's important to do that analysis, and it's m especially if you're in a position where you are having to convince the organisation, um, it's important to have the information at your fingertips. And there's so many tools out there that do it. There's so, m there's so many ways of getting all the information you need. The, the trick that hasn't quite been dealt with yet is how to bring it all together. We've ended up building our own system, but I think we're on the cusp of having good m and &E systems for communications that will bring together tweets, bring together various other things, um, especially I think the r academic world is leading on this one actually. There's a, there's a um, movement called Altmetrics, which is about um, primarily about academic papers um, and it's, it's trying to get together all of the different types of ways in which reach and engagement can be seen and give you a kind of dashboard view of it. Unfortunately, it it's at the moment limited by very academic things like it, things need to have a digital object identifier and probably be published in a journal and various other things. But I'm hopeful that um, the think tank world may be able to catch up and, and persuade academics that a better view of scholarly output would be a wider view of scholarly output than just journals. Great, thanks. I mean, on the embargoes thing, I think I would add also that it's a, it proves a useful um, tool for think tanks themselves to actually coordinate the publication of a, a report or something like that. So um, while it may not be so useful anymore because the news for the news cycle, it actually helps us focus on when we're, when we're going to launch and get all of our materials out at that time. And I think that, that in itself is a valuable thing. Um, okay, can we have some more questions? Can I just you? answer yeah. the point about enemies of change and resistance? I'm not can sure I just any take of us some more it. questions? Yeah, I know yeah, that a lot of people <laughs> want to get in and then we can come back no, to that. Um, okay, so we've got one at the back there. We can take that. Um, one in the middle here and one on the back row there. And I'll come to you guys later. Thank you. Hi, Louis Quappe from the Pearson Think Tank. Um, you spoke a bit about, uh, Richard, about the kind of uh, the way campaigns and policy and other things interact, but I wondered if the panel could talk a bit more about all of these trends around digital communications, the speed of communications, how that's actually changing the policy making process. Okay, um, the other one was here. Sorry, it's just here. Um, as a, a, a new think tank, only four years old, um, from the Institute for Government, my name's Nadine Smith. We've, uh, we've been put under quite some pressure um, as an organisation to demonstrate impact um, of what we're doing. And um, I'm interested to know whether that is something that people here are finding as well, and whether that's something that is a role for the communications team as much as it is for everybody else. And I'm not talking about column inches, downloads, I'm talking about tracking the progress of your recommendation, seeing whether or not it's having any traction, checking then even perhaps years later as to whether that was even the right recommendation when it was implemented and how that went. And that I think, so th I'm talking really I think generally about the new breed of communications person in the think tank is I think becoming less about news, although that is always going to be um, probably your primary function, but it's becoming increasingly more about understanding whether 
and having a role in crafting the recommendations and the messaging and actually tracking how that's going over the long term practically, whether it's in government or in public services. Great, okay, and just behind you, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, hello, I'm, I'm um, Tim Finch from IPPR, and I'm sorry that there's another IPPR person in this uh, discussion. Uh, I'm Director of Communications at IPPR, so I'm nominally Richard's boss, but the emphasis on the word nominal. <laughs> uh, we, 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 we all work very collaboratively. And I, I wanted to uh, put the question particularly to Nick, I think, because um, Richard mentioned that, that we, we, we recognise the importance of this fourth element, and, and one of the ironies of it is we don't have a very big comms team, but we don't employ anybody. Um, uh, and we have, we're lucky to have interns who uh, compensate for that a bit, but we don't employ anybody who, as it were, is that their primary skill is that they they understand that uh, understand the digital world. Uh, and I'm just wondering. I mean, one of one of the problems we obviously have, I think, in the think tank world is we're often uh, only funded through projects. And it's interesting to me, and um, some of the thunders in the room might reflect on this that. There seems to be actually remarkably little pressure from funders to, uh, to to ask you to deliver these sorts of things. That, that you know, it's still the case that you can put together a proposal that says uh, report, seminar, press release, and that'll do. They're not saying where's the video, where's the uh, prezi, where's the slide share. And consequently, it's often difficult to carve out uh, funds, money available to do these things. So we're trying to do it uh, on the sly or just add it in and bolting it on, as you say. And I'm, I'm hoping that, that funders might um, start to change on that sort of thing. But that means you've got a limited amount of budget, and there's two ways you could spend it. You could either go find the expertise from outside, which we often have to do because we don't possess it inside, or we can, or we can start employing someone like you. So I suppose the question is, is wh wh what, would you, what, what do you think? Do you, do you think now there comes a time where uh, a self-respecting think tank that doesn't have someone uh, called a digital manager or something similar uh, is really rather stuck in the past. Okay, great, thank you. So we've got three questions, um, looking one looking at the speed um, of digital change in policy making, um, the other one looking at how you uh, measure the impact of your communications, and then the final one about do we all need a digital manager. Um, perhaps on that, you'd like to start, Nick. Yeah. Um, the do think thanks need someone like me? <laughs> Possibly. It's going to be a surprise if you say no. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. I, I think um, do w where I think an interesting question is if, if a think tank feels they need that kind of leadership, where does that person sit as well? And I think, I think actually I've, I'm increasingly seeing that there is a role for someone who knows the digital world to look at the research and management practices of a think tank too. And I think that actually it's, it, communications is part of it but the, the way in which uh, digital communications works actually affects the whole remit of a think tank. So probably there is a need for at least, at the very least, someone who can advise on those things. Whether that's someone that you buy in or someone that you hire really depends on probably the size of the, those things. But I think understanding what is happening in the world and how that affects the research process, the management process and the communications process and how you can respond to that is very important. I think there's still a need um, for doers um, in terms of uh, some of the more, the more practical digital outputs um, because you can't immediately expect researchers to be producing audio files and those kinds of things. Um, so there's this kind of support need. But then I am very, very keen to, to push the idea that researchers themselves actually have the biggest, the, the best access to some of the, to the ability to produce good content. Um, so our researchers, are, for example, would produce much better audio interviews than we had because they have much better access to, the, to interesting people than we have in the communications team. Um, our researchers um, definitely write better blogs. I mean, that it, it's kind of the same process we've been through with blogs. I think we need to look at for the wider set of things, how researchers seem very comfortable now with writing blogs. Can they be comfortable with, with interviewing someone, even if someone else then does the, the editing and all of those things? Can they be comfortable with some of the other skills to help generate the content from the kinds of interactions they have? And 
it really, uh, yeah, it's contextual. I think at ODI, I wasn't hired as a, a digital manager. I was hired as a website person to update the website. I embarked on, I embarked and made that change happen because I didn't think that was that they were hiring the right thing. I wanted it, but I didn't think they were hiring the right thing. Um, and so I've had to, the business change process has all been about trying to carve the space for myself to be able to do this other stuff. Okay, thanks. Um, John, do you want to pick up on any of this? I think I could talk a little bit about how it's changed policy, or at least think a bit about it. I probably can't answer the other questions, which are more specifically about the inner workings of think tanks. How has it changed policy? I think probably less than we might think. Um, I think it's improved lives for people like us who are all interested in policy questions, because it makes it very easy for us to follow you know, examples of people doing similar work all around the world. You know, if you're a fiscal policy person now, it's incredibly easy to follow the debate on, you know, austerity or stimulus in the US, in France, you know, everywhere else. You can follow a handful of people on Twitter and have it all there on a plate. I think what you shouldn't, or what we shouldn't get sucked into thinking is that because it makes uh, sort of the thinking of the elite whom Richard pointed to at the beginning, uh, more sort of data heavy and um, gives kind of make, makes it richer that that changes very much um, you know sort of beyond uh, those few thousand people who are um, following the particular expert on you know fiscal policy uh, at the IMF or the OECD. Most people use Twitter for celebrity news. Um, I don't think it's you know had a it's had some kind of political impact, but I think it's easy to overstate it. I mean, one example of this, I was just thinking when, I, when the question was asked, on the Shooter's Index, we could, uh, we could put, there lots of people, do you remember when the Arab Spring kicked off, lots of people said, oh, it's all about Twitter. Um, if we put, I don't know what the result of this is going to be, but if we put internet penetration or internet users to 100%, um, what do we get? So we would say the most likely candidate for change is the United Arab Emirates which has had seen, you know, no revolution. Bahrain a bit, Kuwait, no, it's pretty stable. Qatar, pretty stable. You know, Saudi Arabia. A lot of the places that have got rid of their leaders, um, uh, you know, like Egypt, um, you know, Syria at the moment, um, are, are near the bottom. Uh, so I think it's easy to get overexcited about this. Um, the, just talk very quickly about what I think really does change policy from a journalist's point of view. Um, my favourite think tank um, outside Britain, I'm not going to give a British example because it would be uh, unfair and I might get sort of you know, rotten vegetables thrown at me, <laughs> is, a, is an American think tank called the Centre for Courts Innovation, which some of you may be familiar with. They're doing a bit of work here in the UK now. But um, they, their big thing is problem-solving courts and, and uh, sort of justice that tries to uh, be less expensive and, and more effective. And they don't just write about how you might do this. In theory, they run a court in Red Hook, which is a tough neighborhood of uh, New York. And so it makes their argument so much more powerful that they can say, you know, we've got all this evidence and we, you know, we think this is the case, but actually you as a journalist can come and take a look at this court and see how it works. Um, it focuses on, uh, they've got quite a lot of gun crime in, in Red Hook, so it's particularly sort of gun crime, um, smarter ways to uh, deal with gun crime in the criminal justice system than chucking people <laughs> in prison for a long time where they meet other people who are sort of handy with firearms. Uh, so I would love to see the IPPR, you know, running a hospital, and I would love to see um, the ODI running, uh, you know, kind of running some interesting aid program somewhere. I think that would be great. <laughs> um, and Richard, if you've got a few quick thoughts yeah, before we get up, I just come back to this question about resistance to change because I think, like in any, whenever in any organisation where you're going to try and change things, you're always going to get that guy who sits in the corner and just refuses to to, to partake. Uh, and so I think the thing is to get try and get critical mass. Um, and I think you find that the power of ego is a really <coughs> powerful one. I mean, you know, lots written about how social media is making us more egocentric people. Um, but I do think researchers at think tanks do like to get the credit for what they do. And I think digital communications helps them get the credit. And especially the way we've talked about using it, it helps them personally just as much as, as, as kind of organisationally. And actually, I think it, it sort of makes them more visible in a way that in the past they might have sort of hid behind the brand or not been um, kind of out there front and centre. Um, and then Nadine's point about you know, pressure to track progress, I think it's a really important point because you know, measuring change rather is so much harder than measuring coverage. 
Um, but we are in the change business. You know, the coverage is for the sake uh, of change. But I also think that comms teams do have a, a role in recommendations. And I find this at IPPR because the press, the drafting of the press release it really is the sharp end of the recommendation forming process. And, uh, you know, lots of times we go back to a report and change the recommendations in light of having finally got to draft 12 of the press release that is now the final one that we're going to send out. Because especially more junior researchers do not think when they're coming up with recommendations, how is my director going to justify this on the Today programme under pressure from John Humphreys? But at the end, but we do think like that. Uh, and that's why we ask them difficult questions about their recommendations and that's why they crumble and they have to go back and, uh, and rewrite them sometimes. And, and the reason I really like these short videos is because they're essentially a digital elevator pitch so, you know, I've worked for cabinet ministers and I know how time poor they are. And you were talking about the changing nature of the policy making process. I mean, it, you know, I think journalists are time poor, politicians are time poor, okay, everybody's time poor. But researchers need, as well as, you know, to do a nine month project and then write a 50 page report, they also need to be able to say, you know, if, if you got on to the elevator on the ground floor with the government minister in the relevant area for this policy, what would you say? you know, as you went up the five floors to their office. And that's 60 seconds. And if, if, if you can't get that pitch, you can't get that elevator pitch, you know, go back. And if it takes you another nine months, then come back. But, but it shouldn't. You know, if you spent nine months looking at all the data, you ought to know what is the compelling case for change that you're making. And if you turn that into digital content, you know, you get that uh, in front of the, the time poor policymakers. And it's, and it's those interactions... Uh, and kind of trips and visits and, you know, ministers say, well, I, you know, I was collared by someone and they made a... And all they're doing is they made a really compelling argument in 60 seconds and they come back to their departments <coughs> and then lots of officials get to work on the detail of those ideas, but they have to be able to be boiled down. OK, brilliant, thank you. Um, can we have some more questions? Yeah, so one here. Um, Jonathan and the lady at the back there. Hi, um, William French from the Embassy of Switzerland. Um, very interesting discussion. I wanted to ask what you all think about how the growth of digital platforms and possibilities um, increases both the capacity and the need for think tanks and indeed uh, media publications to engage with their peers in other countries, especially given the nature of many policy debates, whether it's youth unemployment or housing or immigration, um, strike a chord in many okay. countries. Great, thank you. Okay, Jonathan? Yeah, I'm Jonathan from ODI. Um, really quick observation, just to, to reinforce what John said about the, the power of audio. We've been using audio to get some really big global names recently. It takes five minutes. It gets people on your website you wouldn't dream of having there otherwise. Um, and also, when you do podcasts with researchers, it's a really good way of getting good, stronger media values into the way that they're able to perform as well. So I'd, I'd really reinforce that. And I'd say we've got some great sanitation content that would look great on economist.com <laughs> forward slash bogs, but we can talk about, <laughs> talk about that at the time. Um, but my question is, is to say, well, my question is, what is the right balance between a communications team for a, f a future think tank around dissemination versus creation? Because a lot of what we're thinking about and what we're doing at the moment is creating content because we've got a captive audience that digital channels have been able to give us. But yet, whilst Richard's pointing to falling numbers of newspaper circulation, a very good day for ODI on Twitter is still when we've got something on the Independent or the Guardian website. It's still those news organisations that drive that. So if we're moving from a position where researchers create and communicators disseminate, to a position where researchers create, communicators create even more, and then they disseminate. What's the creation versus dissemination balance going to look like in the future? Okay, great. And the final question um, was the lady at the back there. Hi, I am. I'm Georgia Hussey. I'm an intern at IPPR, and I do the video stuff there. So my question is kind of about that. Um, you touched earlier on how like blogs on websites are kind of not really worth it anymore for think tanks and actually you know you get articles you place them on on other sites for the videos i mean at the moment we just put them up online or on youtube and and they don't really go anywhere i mean is the future of like think tank videos to sort of pitch them to you know ex to, for external sources to like publish them great okay 
Thank you. Um, we've got literally five minutes. So I'm going to take Rich's uh, challenge to do an elevator pitch and present it to you all. Um, do you want to start, uh, John? Some OK, responses? I'll be really quick. International, is it important to interact with people in other countries? Yes. Mm -hmm. The Economist was born international. Our first edition, which I dug out the other day, was published in uh, around about 1850. W the first article was about a trade treaty that Britain had concluded with Brazil and how incredibly unfair it was on Brazil. So we've been doing this for a very, very long time. We think the world is moving in our direction, and we think this is part of the reason why our circulation has steadily grown over the last you know, 10, 20 years, while that's not the case for lots of print media. Uh, Audio. Uh, audio is fantastic, and anybody who thinks it's expensive should just consider, consider the fact that any of your researchers who have an iPhone in their pocket have a sophisticated recording device with them uh, at all times, and all they need to do when they're interviewing some person who they think might make a really interesting little podcast on your website is bring it out, put it on the table, and hit record. It's incredibly easy, uh, so that's a great thing. Um, what should you do with your videos? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I suspect part of it is that there are lots of platforms out there, uh, free platforms, which are really, really hungry for content. They can't get enough. So if you can go to them and say, we've got this video, um, they'll be pleased. The Economist, as I said, operates a different business model. We produce all our content in-house. We've always done that. You know, people have never written kind of authored pieces uh, in, in The Economist. Um, so we don't do it. We have uh, all our stuff is, well, it's not all behind a paywall, but um, a paywall kicks in at, at some stage. But uh, there are some media organizations like that. There are others, you know, Huffington Post comes to mind, where it's all about getting as many people as you can, and they just want all the content they can get. So I'm sure there ought to be outlets for you there, because, the, you know, those people are hungry. Great. Nick? Okay. Um, should you pitch videos to external so sources? Yes, you should pitch any content that external sources, any content you produce, you should find the place that will take it if you can. Um, and definitely don't, you know, definitely add it to YouTube and that kind of stuff anyway, because it does have some, some sort of follow on. Um, balance between dissemination and creation. I think that's a really interesting um, discussion. I think the, um, I think the, com I the question you phrased was, what should the communications team's balance be? Um, I've always tended to be on the side of um, uh, dissemination um, and supporting content creation, but and I would like the researchers to be a lot more involved as in the content creation process and us to be kind of heads of profession in message, in channel, in whatever, and helping them to understand the best way to, to deliver it. But they are going to be the best ones to deliver it, hopefully. Um, and should... Uh, think tanks engage with peers in other countries. I mean, I think um, we, maybe because it, we are international development think tank, we do. Um, and yes, uh, absolutely, we sh they, they should. And there's a lot of sort of crossover. I think the one of the things about the digital age is that it increases the competition from other countries because lots of uh, organizations can go on to other patches. So we in ODI now have competitors that were previously US development think tanks that work in Europe. And we have to engage with them and sometimes work with them and sometimes we're competing for the same work. It's just the way the, way the world is now. And Richard, your final thoughts? Um, William, his name is French, but he's Swiss. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, I, I do about engagement with other countries, but we, we love to uh, rank ourselves against other countries. There's a great Matthew Taylor joke um, which I will fail to deliver properly, but uh, it's about the time I in the early days of IPPR when they didn't have a very good server and they uploaded a report to the website which was called the Swedish model, and it crashed. <laughs> uh, uh, now, uh, I love press releases which start, the UK is the worst in the world at... I don't really care what the end of that sentence is. <laughs> I like the start. Um, Jonathan, 100% yes. Uh, the specialist is dead. Long live the generalist uh, and our gainful employment for the rest of uh, humanity. <laughs> um, Georgia Videos definitely um, allows me to plug a couple of organisations that, that I think are great. Um, Joseph Roundtree Foundation have a brilliant series with The Guardian called Breadline Britain. I think they did five videos, one a day for a week. They are heartbreaking uh, insights into what it is like to live lives on poverty. They are incredibly high quality videos. You'll find them just by Googling Breadline Britain JRF. Uh, they're fantastic. And 
it's it's because the Guardian and JRF work together. I think that the product has come out so well. Um, and uh, but the flip side to that is, can you do it on your own? RSA Animate, uh, which someone tweeted and said we should have mentioned it, and uh, you know it was in the first draft of my slides. I'm a huge fan of RSA Animate. They do show that you can create something that nobody else does and get known for it and create your own channel. So it is doable, but they, I don't like to think about how much money they've invested in doing that. But um, again, Google it, look it up. RSA Animate is an amazing way to take uh, what is already a very high quality speaker series, but then take it to a global audience. Fantastic. Great, thank you very much. So um, just to, to wrap up really, I think clearly there's real demand to talk about this topic, judging by the number of people in the room, the, the Twitter interactions and the uh, live streaming. Um, this event really is kind of just the start of some rare collaboration in the think tank world. And one of the things that I've kind of taken away from it is that think tanks are in competition. Um, Richard and I have a healthy element of competition on Twitter. I think one of the first uh, times I came across him, he was tweeting his disgust at the SMF winning think tank of the year, but you know, <laughs> we won it, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but and we are in competition, we're in competition, as I said at the start, for funds, for, for speakers, for um, coverage. But um, dig and digital, in a way, opens up that and kind of cracks it right open and shows right there that we are all in competition, but it also gives us opportunities to watch what each other's doing and learn. Um, so it's uh, yeah, it's, it's providing us with a, a great opportunity and I think a healthy, f thriving, and maybe because I work for the Social Market Foundation, competitive think tank <laughs> market <laughs> is good for civil society. So um, I'm aware that lots of questions remain and there, was, there were a lot, of, um, a lot that came through on this iPad here that I wasn't able to get to. That's where the LinkedIn group comes in. Um, so it's called Wonkcom, so do join it on LinkedIn. Um, the video will be up online um, next week, I think. And um, look out for a blog this afternoon, I think, from the ODI on this and continued um, interaction on this issue using the hashtag wonkcoms. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much to our panel, um, not only for their um, excellent and insightful contributions, but thanks to Richard and Nick uh, for helping drive this event forward. I think Richard's um, single-handed Twitter campaign and getting people in the room really worked. <laughs> um, but thank you too to John for bringing us some really great insights from The Economist and inspiring us all with the Big Mac Index. Um, and thanks finally to the ODI for hosting us and enabling us to put on this really important event. So let's thank the panel in the usual way. <laughs>